I was recently asked by Linda Hogan to write an essay about pain for a book that will be about living with long-term pain. So this is, this is the essay that I wrote, and it's, it's fairly long. When I was a child, my father raped my mother, my sister, and me. He beat everyone in the family but me. He broke my sister's arm. My brother has epilepsy from blows to the head. We each in our own way learned to persist. We learned to be mules, to be impervious to whatever happened. Oh, we'd break and we'd run and we'd cry and we'd plead, but somewhere inside each of us stood a mule who could and would take every blow and not give an inch. Or put another way, inside each of us was a box into which we could climb and where we could not be touched. My favorite film, even as a young child, was not 101 Dalmatians or Mary Poppins or The Jungle Book, but rather Lawrence of Arabia. Early in the film, Lawrence slowly put out a match with his fingers. A minor character tried that and said it hurt, to which Lawrence responded, the trick is not minding that it hurts. That was how we, or at least I, learned to deal with the pain, by not minding that it hurt. There are circumstances in which it's in one's best interest to not feel pain. Circumstances in which it can be dangerous and even fatal to allow oneself the luxury of feeling pain. Circumstances in which a person just needs to survive, just needs to get done what needs to be done. Imagine every bad horror movie you've ever seen. Imagine a protagonist running through a dark forest chased by the killer, wielding, wielding a chainsaw, gun, butcher knife. The protagonist stumbles, of course, and turns an ankle, of course. What does the protagonist do? Scream, of course, giving away location. And then, of course, the protagonist takes time to rub the ankle before hobbling away. Now, let's say you're being chased. You stumble and break your ankle. What do you do? You don't scream and you don't rub your ankle. You get back up and you run like the fucking wind because you, by which I mean every bit of you, including your ankle, knows that if you don't, you will die. And you keep running until A, your body gives out, B, your will gives out, or C, you get away. Then, you worry about your ankle, which is pretty much how I lived my childhood. This is, sadly, not as uncommon as we would wish. Trauma, especially long-term trauma, can, like pain, especially long-term pain, become pervasive. It can suffuse the air we breathe, the water we drink. It can permeate every cell, every organ, the marrow of every bone. It can inform every decision we make or fail to make. What happens when the box you made to protect yourself becomes not just a refuge, but a prison? What happens when an important and reasonable means of surviving danger and trauma becomes not just an important and reasonable means of surviving danger and trauma, and not even just a habit, but a way of being in the world? In college, after I broke my hand playing softball, I finished the game. In fact, wrapped a line drive single to center. My life wasn't on the line. It wasn't even the World Series or anything. It was a damn intramural softball game with stakes approaching zero. Yet still, I pushed away the pain to finish the game. A couple years later, I broke my foot playing intramural flag football. I finished the game, same deal as before, zero stakes, but I still manifested that compulsion, mindset, habit, way of being, to not attend to the pain. I was at the time a collegiate conference high jumping champion. The next few months, I kept high jumping on that broken foot. I'd hobble to my mark, make the pain disappear, then run my approach and jump, re-breaking the foot every time. Then it hobbled out of the pit and do it again. This means of dealing with the pain that protected me as a child did me no favors when it came to high jumping. I broke my foot in the fall, and all those jumps where I rebroke my foot came in practice. Had I listened to the pain and taken a couple of months off, my foot would have been healed in time for track season. As it was, I cost myself months of additional pain and wasted the entire season by not listening to my body. My next big lesson in pain came in my 24th summer. I've had Crohn's disease my whole life with attendant diarrhea, gut pain, late growth spurt, and so on. Then that summer, the disease ran riot. I was defecating more than 40 times a day and throwing up from the pain at least 10 times a day. I fell back on what had worked for me so many times before. I became a mule and stood unmoving, ignoring the pain the best I could. Eating made the pain worse, so I quit eating. I kept thinking I could wait it out. Eventually, I thought, the pain will stop and I can quit being a mule and get on with my life. I lost about 40% of my body weight. I'm six feet tall and got down to not much over 100 pounds. I started bleeding internally, filling toilet bowls with bright red blood, and finally realized I needed to go to the hospital. 
That first night in the hospital, I received my next lesson from pain. The pain was severe enough and it lasted long enough that it overwhelmed every defense I had. Becoming a mule didn't work. Climbing into a box didn't work. Not minding that it hurt didn't work. Other forms of denial didn't work. My body was giving out and my will gave out completely. Had someone walked into the hospital room with a gun and said, shoot yourself, and the pain will go away and you can sleep, I would have done it. Had they said, shoot the person next bed and the pain will go away and you can sleep, I would have done it. I would have done whatever they said to make the pain go away, to make it so I could sleep. Not out of desperation, but because I no longer cared about anyone or anything. I no longer existed. The point is not my particular pain. Instead of Crohn's, it could have been sciatica, heart pain, a broken neck, kidney stones, migraines, arthritis. I've got my pain and you've got yours. Nobody gets through life unscathed. The first point is an obvious one. Sometimes fight or flight saves your life, and sometimes it doesn't. In other words, no one response to pain is appropriate in every circumstance. Sometimes pain is to be ignored. Sometimes it's to be avoided or numbed out. Sometimes it's to be listened to just enough to slow us down. Sometimes it tells us, stop right there, buster. There are many things it can tell us. While sometimes pain is just pain, it always conveys information. And sometimes it's appropriate to listen to it. The second point is just as obvious, and one that we as a society nearly always forget. This is that we are our bodies. Our animal bodies are not mere vehicles we can trade in for newer models. They are our only home. They are us. They are the only us there is. The belief that we are not our bodies harms not only our own lives, but the lives of everyone on the planet, as this culture perceives the entire planet as merely a vehicle for our consciousness and for our will, and something to be traded away for a new one instead of cherished as our only home, instead of being recognized as a larger community of whom we are a part. How are we taught in this culture to identify more with our wills than with our bodies? They're both parts of ourselves. The third point is that the will can only ignore the body for so long before one, the other, or both give out. And if my body gives out so much that it dies, by which I mean if I give out so much that I die, my will obviously dies as well. The same is true on a global ecological scale. If the earth dies, we die. This is something else our culture clearly doesn't understand. Wait, you know what I said above about pain being something to listen to? What a bunch of bullshit that is. Pain is not something to listen to. Pain is a sharp clawed, sharp toothed animal shredding its way through your guts. It's a long rusty screw stuck up your urethra, twisting, twisting, twisting. It's a glass ball broken into a thousand slivers that are pushed through muscle and stuck into bone. It's a single long needle running from your eyeball to the back of your brain. It's brass knuckles pushing into your breastbone, crushing your heart and leaving you clawing at your own throat. It's a knife stuck in your lower belly, then slowly drawn pelvic point to pelvic point till you're puking on the floor. It's not just the quick snap of bone and then it's over. It's the dull throb that grows and grows and will not go away. Pain is not knowing if the pain you feel now will ever abate or if it will be with you forever. Pain is the guest who, uninvited and unwelcome, becomes your closest companion. Pain is a great gaping, pulsing, tearing hole through which your energy drains till there's nothing left of you but a bag of skin that somehow trudges from one place to another. A bag of skin on a perpetual forced march. Sometimes pain is a presence and that you may only notice that part of your body when it hurts. As is true, I think, for most people, most of the time, most of my body doesn't exist. I don't generally have shoulders, elbows, or wrists. I don't think I've ever had hips. I can't remember ever having had a spleen, liver, or kidneys. For about a year, a decade ago, I had a penis, and it was bad. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Sometimes, unfortunately, I have a heart, and I always have intestines. Not a day, not a moment passes in which I don't have intestines. And of course, I got elbows and wrists and most everything else most of us have. But I never think about them. Why would I? My shoulders are doing shoulder things. My elbows are doing elbow things. And me? Most of the time, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Right now, I'm walking through a forest. I'm putting one foot in front of the other, but not thinking about it. Hips, hamstrings, quadriceps, knees, calves, ankles, feet, even toes are all doing their things while I'm thinking about the fact that I'm not thinking about them. I stop, look at soft sunlight through the understory, see spider webs strung between broken remains of sloughed off lower branches as the webs reflect in this light. And I remember that I have eyes. I've forgotten, as I almost always do. 
How often do you think about your lower lip, your teeth, your tongue, the back of your throat? How often do you think about your lungs? If you're like me, almost never. We've got something like 700 muscles in our bodies. We can't pay attention to all of them all the time. But I do think about my intestines. When I'm walking, when I'm looking at sunlight in a forest, looking at spider webs, when I'm noticing I have eyes. Even when I'm feeling rather more glad that I have a penis than I did when I had that prostate infection 10 years ago, I'm still thinking about my intestines. So don't tell me pain is something to be listened to, to be learned from. Only someone who has never felt real pain could say something so absurd. Pain is something to be avoided or numbed out. But what are the personal and social consequences of consistently avoiding or numbing out pain? Are there consequences more severe than missing out on a season of high jumping, or for that matter, making my Crohn's flare worse? To misquote Casablanca, as personally disappointing as was missing a season of jumping, or as painful as was that flare, it doesn't take much to see that the problems of one little person don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. In short, how would we characterize our collective response to pain, and what are the consequences of this response? I want to tell you about three conversations. Conversation one. Back in the 1990s, my friend the novelist John Keeble wrote a nonfiction book about the Exxon Valdez oil spill. One evening, soon after the book came out, we sat in the living room with a log home he'd built by hand. He told me the spill was, quote, like a parable in which the history of destruction is condensed and quite evident. The initial devastation, the cause, the continuing effects, the institutionalization of remedies, the denial, the propaganda, the forgetfulness. It's there for us to see and consider and yet we choose not to. I thought, but do not say that this parable applies on every level, from the abuse of our bodies to the toxification of the total environment to the murder of the planet. We spoke more about denial and about our denial of our relationships to our bodies and our denial of our participation in processes of life and death. He said, part of the problem is that death is not part of our daily lives. We have a very curious escapist attitude about death and managed to distance it, too, through a bizarre form of institutionalization, mortuaries and heavy doses of sap. What is required is a change of heart, and in order to change our hearts, we have to start seeing things differently. If death is a part of daily life, then one is much less likely to romanticize it and at the same time to deny it. The truth, in my view, is that neither romanticizing nor denying death is honest or useful. It's more useful to begin accepting death as part of the grid of daily life. The effect of that would be to increase one's respect for it, and thus, one's respect for life. For conversation two, let's move ahead 10 years to the early 2000s. I'd been an environmental activist for 12 or 13 years, more than a decade of fighting to save land I love, and losing far more often than not. More than a decade of watching forests become clear-cut moonscapes that wrap around mountains, drop into valleys, climb ridges to fragment watershed after watershed. More than a decade of sitting silent near empty streams that two generations ago were lashed into whiteness by uncountable salmon coming home to spawn and die. More than a decade of watching so much of what I love destroyed. More than a decade of watching, as John Keeble put it, the initial devastation, the cause, the continuing effects, the institutional re institutionalization of remedies, the denial, the propaganda, the forgetfulness, again and again and again. A friend, a new activist, called me one day crying. She said, this work's killing me. It's breaking my heart. I said, yeah, it'll do that. She said, the dominant culture hates everything, doesn't it? I said, yeah, it does. She said, unless it's stopped, it's going to kill everything on the planet, isn't it? I said, yes, it is, unless it's stopped. She said, we're not going to make it some great new glorious tomorrow, are we? I thought a moment, and then I said what I knew all along was the best thing I could say, which was, I've been waiting for you to say that. The reason I knew that was the best thing I could say had to do with conversation three. Eight or nine years earlier, I underwent a similar collapse. I found myself bursting into sobs on a weekly and sometimes daily basis. The horrors inflicted on the natural world were too much for me to bear. A lot of my environmentalist friends told me, just take some time off, relax, think about other things. The problems will still be there when you come back. I didn't think that would help. How does not attending to the problems help? It might make me more rested, but I'm not the problem. The problem is this culture is killing the planet. I don't see how thinking about other things will help either me or more importantly, the planet. And in any case, what's wrong with crying? If we're not going to cry about the murder of the planet, what exactly is worth crying about? And if we're not going to resist and stop the murder of the planet, what is worth resisting and what is worth stopping? 
I called up my friend, the Okanagan Indian writer and activist, Jeanette Armstrong. I was crying. I said to her, this work's killing me. It's breaking my heart. She said, yeah, it'll do that. I said, the dominant culture hates everything, doesn't it? She said, yes, it does, even itself. I said, unless it's stopped, it's going to kill everything on the planet, isn't it? She said, yes, it is, unless it's stopped. I said, we're not going to make it some great new glorious tomorrow, are we? And then she said the best thing she could possibly say, which was, I've been waiting for you to say that. The reason that was the best thing she could say is that it normalized my despair and let me know that despair is an appropriate response to a desperate situation. It let me know that the appropriate response to a desperate situation is not to spend time pretending it's not desperate, which is just another form of numbing. And the appropriate response to a painful situation is not just to pretend it's not painful. It let me know that sorrow is just sorrow and pain is just pain. It's not so much the sorrow or even the pain that hurts as it is my resistance to it. There's this idea, and this is as true on a personal medical situation as it is on the murder of the planet, that if you acknowledge how bad things are, you have to go around being miserable all the time. So we waste tremendous amounts of time and energy trying to avoid acknowledging the reality in which we find ourselves embedded instead of simply acknowledging our situation and then figuring out what we're going to do about it. Yeah, I've got a painful, incurable disease. I can either spend a lot of energy pretending I don't, or I can fucking accept that this is my reality and then do whatever needs to be done. I'm a complex enough being that I can hold in my heart the understanding that I have an incurable disease, but life is still really great, and this life is worth fighting for. And yeah, this culture is killing the planet, and I can either spend a lot of energy pretending it isn't, or I can fucking accept that this is reality and then do whatever needs to be done. I'm a complex enough being that I can hold in my heart the understanding of how profoundly evil and destructive this culture is, but that life is really great and life on this planet is worth fighting for. One of the reasons my mother stayed with my father is that there weren't battered women's shelters in the 1950s and 1960s. But another reason was the false hope that he would change. False hopes are killers. Getting the diagnosis of Crohn's disease was one of the worst days of my life, but at the same time, one of the most liberating, and that it freed me of the false hope that the condition I had was easily curable, or indeed curable at all. It freed me to start making reasoned decisions as to how I would live my life, given once again the reality in which I found myself embedded. It had been the same on the familial scale, as losing the false hope my father would change allowed us all to make better decisions. And it's true on a global ecological scale. Does anyone really believe that if we can just get a Democrat in the White House, then things will be okay? Does anyone really believe that capitalism can be good for the planet if it's just powered by wind and solar? Does anyone think Weyerhaeuser will stop deforesting because we ask nicely? That Monsanto will stop Monsantoing? Over the decades, I've asked literally thousands of people if they believe that this culture will undergo a voluntary transformation to a sane, sustainable way of living. And nobody ever says yes. The next question. For those of us who care about life on the planet, what does that mean for our strategy and for our tactics? The answer, we don't know because we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it because we're also busy pretending we have hope. We're also busy doing anything we can to avoid feeling the pain of our situation. And false hopes are one of the means we use to avoid feeling the pain of our current circumstances. False hopes are like narcotics, useful when pain is unavoidable, but potentially addictive and with side effects. A side effect or maybe primary effect of false hopes is that they bind us to unlivable situations, and they blind us to real possibilities. What does this have to do with pain? Everything. Let's say my father is beating one of my siblings, or let's say I have a broken foot, or let's say I'm undergoing a flare of Crohn's. I can have the false hope that my father will stop. I can have the false hope that if I just ignore the pain in my foot, it will go away. I can have the false hope that if I ignore the pain in my guts, it'll go away. Or I can recognize these hopes are false and do something to make the primary pain stop. The problem, however, isn't just false hope. The problem can also be hope itself. Maybe 10 years ago, I was doing a talk where I was bashing false hope, and then I started bashing hope too. Someone in the audience shouted out, what's your definition of hope? I turned the question around and asked the audience to define it. They came up with a great one. Hope is a longing for a future condition over which you have no agency. That's how we use the word in everyday life. I don't hope I eat lunch in a few minutes. I'm simply going to do it. On the other hand, the next time I get on a plane, I hope it doesn't crash. Because once I'm in the air, I have no agency. I found myself less interested in hope than I am in agency. Sure, when we have no agency, we must rely on hope. But to rely on hope when we have agency is an abrogation of responsibility and a near guarantee of the continuation of what we hope will stop. This ties back to everything I've been saying in this piece. When I was a child, I had little agency. As such, my choice to become a mule was not merely reasonable, but inspired. 
I was seizing the agency that was left to me. And beyond that, I merely had to hope. Hope that the horrors right now would not be too much. Hope that the horrors would someday stop. But we are not always children. Sometimes we do have agency over more than internal responses. To hope someone's violence stops when one has means to escape this violence or to stop it is to rely on the unreliable. Similarly, I can hope the Crohn's doesn't kill me, but in the meantime, I need to find and use the agency I've got. A woman once asked me, so are you saying I can't hope my brother survives his cancer? I responded, no, of course not. I'm saying you can't stand there with car keys in your hand saying to him, I hope you make it to the hospital. And on a larger scale, I'm so tired of people saying they hope, for example, salmon survive. What salmon need to survive is pretty straightforward. They need for dams to be removed, for industrial logging to stop, for industrial fishing to stop, for global warming to stop, and for the oceans not to be murdered. Those are all straightforward, if daunting, tasks. Those who say they hope salmon survive without work to achieve those preconditions are using hope to avoid the pain of looking honestly at our situation. You could argue that I'm mixing categories here, and you'd be right. A broken foot is not the same as a broken heart, and the death of an individual is not the same as the death of a land. But there are similarities, and here's the problem. This culture has a very curious escapist attitude, not only concerning death, but also sorrow, pain, and most broadly, our bodies. This is a consequence not only of trauma inflicted upon many of us through various forms of abuse, both personal and social, but also this culture's foundational patriarchal beliefs that we are not our bodies, that our minds and what we think are the only things that matter, which is interesting since what really matters is in fact matter, and that our bodies are mere vessels to carry our essence. This leads to a contempt for our bodies and the embodied, and indeed the whole planet. This short essay is not the place to explore this in depth. At this point in the murder of the planet, we should be able to perceive how this contempt for the embodied manifests across this entire culture. As the world is murdered, most of us care more for the health of the economy than the health of the planet. Hell, most of us care more for how the Clemson University Tigers football team does than how real Tigers fare. And so far as global warming, surely you've noticed that all the solutions put forward take industrial capitalism as a given, and the natural world is having to conform to industrial capitalism, instead of making the source of all life primary. That is literally insane in terms of being out of touch with physical reality. As usual in this culture, our social system is, we think, more important than reality. But without a planet, there can be no social system whatsoever. The real world not only is primary, we must perceive it as primary. And let's not forget that someone wrote a book telling us that Earth was put here for us to use and that the real action happens in heaven after we die. And let's not forget that this book became a really big bestseller. If what's happening to the world isn't enough to make this contempt for embodied life clear, a few citations here aren't going to push you over the edge. From the time we are born, we are taught, through philosophy when possible and direct violence when necessary, to dissociate, to not associate with our bodies. As I hope I've made clear, dissociation has its place, especially when we're powerless. But dissociation is by definition a separation from one's body. It's even worse than all this. This culture is based on originally defined yet often unarticulated hierarchy, where violence done by those higher in the hierarchy, those lower is often invisible. And when it is noticed, it's fully rationalized. Violence done by those lower on the hierarchy to those higher is unthinkable, and when it does happen, it's met with shock, horror, and the fetishization of the victims. Our minds are higher on this hierarchy than are our bodies, and we are, according to this culture, not embodied, not animals, not of this earth. And so pain, sorrow, and death become to us both more and less than what they are. What they are are simply pain, sorrow, and death. What they are are the price of admission to this wonderful existence called life on earth. What they are are simply parts of life. They happen to each of us, whether we're dragonflies, fungi, western red cedars, black bears, coho salmon, human beings, or belted kingfishers. But because we do not accept that we are embodied, that we are animals, we cannot accept that what happens to others happens to us as well. How dare our despicable and disloyal bodies interfere with our wondrous minds? How dare we be reminded that we too shall someday die, that we're not the immortal ones, the real ones, the only ones who matter. Sure, pain and death happen to others, especially to non-human others, but not to us. We are the ones who do too, not the ones to whom it's ever done. So pain and sorrow and death become not merely pain and sorrow and death, but blasphemy, an affront to our self-perceived uniqueness in the universe, an affront to our self-perceived superiority to everyone else in the world. I'm not saying we should never take pain pills. Hell, I took one an hour ago. I'm just saying that pain is part of life. 
I'm not saying we can't feel melancholy, grief, fear, or weariness over the gradual loss of physical ability and the increase in pain as we age. I'd be more than glad if I could still jump far higher than my head, but I can't. And that's the point. Reality exists. Life includes loss for everyone, including us. If we live long enough, we will lose more than our ability to jump high or run fast. And if we live long enough, we can expect to lose grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, siblings, friends, lovers. Each day we take one step closer to the front of that line all beings follow, at the end of which we give our bodies to others, one feeding another who then feeds another, to keep the line moving, the line that is the point of all life, the line that is life. And here is where the similarity ends between sorrow at the eventual end of our own lives and sorrow at the murder of the planet. For most of us, human and non-human alike, these losses should be personal, not ecological. Most people, including non-human people, who ever lived would of course lose their relatives, but they would not lose their homes, the land, the water, the air. Yes, old trees fall and new trees spring up in their stead. Rivers flood and create new channels to call home, but to lose a forest entire, to see rivers you loved, dewatered and destroyed, has not been the experience of most. This is not how we're supposed to live. But it is what we have been given, and it is to this we must respond. And that, I suppose, is what I can say about pain and sorrow and loss, both personal and collective. It is what we have been given, and it is to this we must respond.